I'd like to say how thrilled I am that you are looking at human rights through the prism of children today. Um, it's something that I have wanted for a long time, as I had quite an interesting um, life as a disabled child myself. And maybe today I can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but I'm glad to be with you. I wish I could see you all in the room, but I'm doing that in my head. Human rights are incredibly important to me, um, probably because personally I feel we live in a world of great ambiguity and change. And I think human rights gives us a basic common framework of how we should treat each other as decent human beings. It sets the framework and not only does it help us to treat each other as, each other as he, we would want to be treated ourselves, but it provides the government with a threshold from which they must not breach. And that's really important for some governments because as you know, they can be a bit naughty and they can be especially naughty when it comes to disability. Not out of meanness, not out of a wish to not do anything about it, but probably out of a mixture of fear and non-understanding. When I was young, I never felt that my voice was ever heard in terms of my education or even my social life, if it was connected with school. Um, from a very, very early age, um, I always had an acute awareness that I was being left out. Being left out of the curriculum, being left out in terms of being with other children at camps, at guides. Everything I ever did was always with other disabled people in a segregated setting. And I felt suffocated by the paternalistic culture of the time. You know, the highlight of the year was the Round Table Society taking us out for our annual day at Butlins. And I remember seething through the whole day, being totally grumpy, and of course, as all the teachers said, completely ungrateful. And the next day, I would always spend in the headmistress's office being told that I was a very ungrateful and horrible child. And I remain being a pretty horrible child for the 16 years that I was at a special school. And what did that do to me? Well, it made me very unkind to other disabled people because I saw them to be the problem. I suppose us. I hated the label. So I never had a disabled friend out of school. I became a pathological, pathological liar to all my friends at home um, in the sense that I told them that I went to a mainstream public school where I was educated, you know, in a very good way. I forced my mother to go out and buy me a school uniform that I wore to school every day, even though there was no such thing as a, a uniform at my school, as in the way that there was no such thing as a CSE or an O-level, or even the name mathematics. It was always sums, reading and writing, and art. And that's all we did. And so I probably came out with a, with a child of eights, 
educational entertainment. And I was so ashamed. I was ashamed to go on the bus to school. I was ashamed when at the weekend I would see one of my school colleagues across the road being wheeled along and I would force my mother to keep me on the other side of the road. I would never speak to one out of school and I had to carry that with me well into my 20s. And, you know, I don't feel good about it. It was not a good time. But I guess it also triggered um, the other parts of my character, that he is a bit of a rebel, I'm a bit competitive. Um, and I just knew that one day I would somehow do all the things that my sister was doing. And of course I did in the end. Went to university and, you know, I just didn't want ordinary grades. I had to get the best grades. And probably I spent up until the age of 40 trying to prove to the world that I was a valid human being who was intelligent. But it does leave scars. You know, I know they say that every woman feels that they're a bit of a fluke when they get round the board table with all the directors and um, who are men in grey suits and they always feel deeply insecure inside and have to keep on that strong upper lip and just go for it and it's tough. Well the same is true of me but I not only feel it as a woman but I feel it as a stupid special school girl who somehow managed to get the qualifications and to be honest I'm still not quite sure how I did it and whether they were just doing it for, for, to me for a favour. I mean, you really feel that. And it's tough. But also, you feel different. You feel that charity is there to help you, that you do not have fundamental rights to live in your home independently. You feel that you don't have the right to have children because society will say that it's not fair on the child or you're asking for too much. And I suppose that's the nub of it. The minute you start asking to be let in and be accorded the same rights, responsibilities that non-disabled people have, then people think you're asking for too much. They'll give you a little, they love taking you to the seaside for the day because that makes them feel really good about themselves and that's your big day. But what are you supposed to do for the other weeks and weeks and weeks and days of the year? Um, and the answer is not much. So there's a lot of hanging around when you don't have rights. There's a lot of being alone when you don't have rights. And, of course, you're not part of the solution. You're not involved in coming up with ideas about how people should live together. You're always seen as someone who has to be looked after, cared for. You know that word caring? It's such a, such a loaded word. Does it mean that we care for each other and love each other? Or does it mean I'm taking responsibility for you and I'm your carer and this is what you're going to do? I'll leave the audience to decide that one. So, exclusion or segregated segregation is exactly how it is for those who suffered segregation in South Africa. You know, it's apartheid. And 
Some people say, that sounds too strong. How can you compare your oppression to that of slaves or black people who were segregated? And I tell you, it's exactly the same because you are not given or afforded the same value as non-disabled people. Otherwise we'd be, we would have been on buses and in schools and we would have been visible. Well, we've only really started becoming visible over the last 25 years. I think my first feeling of true visibility was when I was sitting on Westminster Bridge in the middle of the road with 50 other disabled people and the police were called and they just looked at us and they truly didn't know whether to give us a pat on the head and a Coca-Cola or arrest us. And for the first time in my life, I felt more powerful than they because they were the confused ones. They were the ones that were disarmed and didn't know what to do. And we were strong and powerful. And human rights, or a knowledge that we had rights, human rights, civil rights, was the antidote for our years and years of segregation and oppression. And life has never been as good as that moment. To be disabled in society in the main means to be poor. There are very few of us living in a bungalow like this. I am deeply privileged and lucky um, to have been an, an, a, a, to be able to earn enough money to help myself climb out of being poor. Because in order for many disabled people to participate, um, money needs to be spent. The convention recognises that you have to think about extending economic rights to disabled people and that benefits are required, national universal benefits, and that money needs to be invested. But you know, it's not all one way because if you don't invest, then actually if you look at the figures, you're going to spend more money keeping people alive, dependent in institutions or at home. There's a knock-on cost to your family who will have to possibly give up their jobs to care for you. So dependency creates um, a huge economic drain. And sadly, governments can only look in terms of the short term. And they look at disabled people, they look at the benefits budget, and they think, well, we can cut that in half. But they're not thinking wisely. They're not thinking intelligently. And if they really knew how they were breaching the Convention on Human Rights, they really understood and they really cared then they would think again. But it is complicated. But yes, to be disabled is to be poor in most cases. I am a total inclusionist. I believe that we should all be in it together for good and bad. And I'm not saying that it's not tough for disabled kids to get along in mainstream society. It is tough. If you do not start that journey together as children, then you're storing up all sorts of problems for when that child becomes a young adult and leaves the, leaves the cosy special school 
everyone loves you and tells you that you're special. Special. Very special. I can tell you there's nothing special about special schools. So you're leaving that environment. And bang! There you are. Faced with a world that is either hostile in terms of the environment, possibly hostile in terms of some attitudes. If you're not going to go and win a gold medal at the Olympics, you know, you're going to be a scrounger. So watch out if you're a disabled kid who can't do any sport. That's going to be a problem. Um, so it is tough. And you have to prepare for that world and learn skills about how to problem solve it. But don't forget that disabled people are the best project managers and problem solvers in the world. We can do things that many non-disabled people simply would not be able to cope with because they haven't got years of experience of trying to survive. Human rights are deeply important because without human rights, without common human rights, disabled people will always feel that they are not part of the world or societies. They will always feel an outsider. And that's the way I have often felt in the past and something that I'm incredibly keen to keep on the political agenda.